Um, I think what might probably be the best thing to do is, um, so I have these topic headings, and even though I'm not going to duplicate the material that is already on that final exam information page, um, I thought what I might do is first, I will write down one or two things that I think is very important in each of these areas. And then, um, and then I'll go through the, the tale of, table of contents for our textbook, trying to um, highlight some things as I look at the table of contents, highlight some things that I think might be important. Now, um, one disclaimer, I haven't written the final exam yet. And um, I, so I have some source of confidence in what I'm covering, uh, with, with what I'm covering in this particular review session, um, in that I tend to be very self-consistent. When I say one thing one time, two years later, and I'm saying, uh, I'm speaking on the same topic, I usually just say the same thing again. <laughs> I'm uh, very uh, consistent that way. So, because I know myself that way, I'm fairly confident that when I tell you that something is important now, that's the same way I will feel as I'm writing the final exam. So there's a good chance what I feel important will factor into the final exam. So that's one source of uh, confidence I have. But um, what I can tell you is I haven't written the final exam yet. So uh, except for very few exceptions, I probably won't be giving you guarantees that something will occur on the final exam or that something won't occur on the final exam. Other than one consistent thing I always say, look at your homework. Whatever is not in your homework, I uh, feel very uncomfortable testing at a difficult level in final exam. And whatever is in your homework, I feel very comfortable putting on your exam, even when, um, even when the material is difficult. So with that, let me start out with one exception. This is one guarantee I can give you. I can guarantee that in the area of kinematics that you will see some type of projectile motion. That's uh, really the one topic in kinematics that ties together a lot of new things you learn in uh, physics 4A. It ties together constant acceleration motion. It ties together uh, uh, vectors because uh, one of the first things you do in analyzing projectile motion is decomposing velocity vectors into y and x component. Uh, it ties together just the general problem solving technique. And so projectile motion is an excellent uh, platform on which to test you on all that. So there will be some aspect of projectile motion that you will see on your final exam. I, uh, in fact, I after writing the exam, I plan to go over and look at it again to make sure I include the projectile motion. So uh, now, uh, how much of the exam will be projectile motion will depend. It could be a single part in a single freeform answer question. It could be five different multiple choice questions. But one thing I can guarantee is that there will be some aspect of projectile motion in your final exam. Um, beyond that, um, I guess that's kind of it for kinematics. Um, as you will hear me say in the final exam review videos, um, kinematics isn't really physics. It's, uh, what's wrong with that pen? Um, it's, uh, well, not really physics. I mean, what, what I mean is in learning about kinematics, um, you didn't learn any laws of physics. All you learned were definitions. Uh, velocity is rate of change of position. Uh, acceleration is rate of change of velocity. And you just uh, applied those definitions. Um, so what it really is, is uh, what I would call mathematical problem solving. So now it is mathematical problem solving is very important to physics. That's uh, why we cover it. And that's why in a class like this, we have to cover it at the beginning. So that um, th this is the place where people who come from different mathematical backgrounds have some time to uh, get acclimated to the types of problem solving you are asked to do in a class like this. So um, 
So yeah, um, the real well, real physics starts out with the forces and uh, forces, uh, with the Newton's second law. With um, um, so after we introduce Newton's second law, we introduce so as you're introducing different types of force. Um, we get to talk about more physical aspects of things, and then we eventually get to work and energy. So, um, so it's all of that I do talk about it in the exam review video, so let me refrain from uh, duplicating that. Instead, what I will tell you is um, what you should uh, expect to see. Um, now, I would be shocked if I didn't include some problem that required you to use a standard strategy. And I hope when I say the word standard strategy, um, you have some idea what I'm referring to. It's that uh, strategy that we use for, that we use for um, um, analyzing forces and later torques. So it, uh, we gave, I gave it to you as a four step strategy in this class, but you know, steps themselves can be broken down in many different ways. But in the four step breakdown, the first step is drawing free body diagram or later on what I would call just the understanding the physical setup. And uh, steps two and, uh, well, uh, step two is you define coordinate axis and um, if I were to speak more general terms, this is where you are setting up the mathematical structure around the, the particular problem you're looking at. It's really getting back to that mathematical problem solving. It's the same thing that you might have done in your uh, calculus class when you are so uh, tackling some word problem. And we, uh, 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 we well, uh, break uh, f forces, into components, and I guess this is just the further um, uh, fleshing out the mathematical details. And the final step in the standard strategy is very important because it sets a paradigm for how you do everything, in how you tackle almost every single physics problem solving. The final step in standard strategy was writing down Newton's second law. And it's not the Newton's second law itself that's important. I mean, you know, there are many problems you will do in physics and engineering that will not um, <laughs> involve Newton's second law, at least not directly. But the reason this is important is because this gives you what we call system of equations. And really the chief goal in the standard strategy and chief goal of any kind of laws of physics, any rules, any engineering facts that you learn is to enable you to do this, to enable you to set up system of equations. This is how we represent information in physics. This is how we uh, write down what we know about a system. And then once you have system of equations written down, then mathematical problem solving kicks in. Uh, that's where you now have to use the tools you learned in math to solve for unknowns, to do all that stuff. But as a beginning place, you need to set up this system of equations. And that's what this uh, Newton's second law step in standard strategy represent. So the standard strategy was the kind of the first problem solving strategy that we introduced that way. And later on, we, um, we introduced some other problem solving techniques. We expand on this standard strategy a little bit. Um, but so now at the end of the, so, you know, when we are introducing standard strategy, we didn't go into all this uh, uh, reason for standard strategy. But now that you are at the end of the semester here, uh, with, at the end of the semester here, then uh, what I want you to be able to do is look back and um, see how all this ties together. Um, this will help you with your future uh, ongoing work in science and engineering. So, um, so yeah. Uh, Cumulative final exam, and one of the reasons to have cumulative final exam was so that I have opportunity to retest, well, re, um, well, so that you have opportunity to show how much you understand about this uh, complex step-by-step -step problem solving approach. Uh, you had a semester to get used to it. Let's see where you are now.
So uh, there will be some question involving standard strategy, and uh, there are many different contexts where uh, I, you can be forced to use a standard strategy. So it could be just uh, um, um, questions that you saw from earlier. It could be basically exam one material, although uh, it's unlikely I'll limit myself to that. Um, there's also static equilibrium. Static equilibrium is um, particularly interesting because it, um, well, it can be interesting because uh, the simpler condition of the acceleration allows me to set up more complex system that's solvable in the limited time you have in the exam. Um, it could be actually now uh, have something to do with the rigid body rotation. Uh, rich, or I guess rigid body motion or dynamics. So, uh, so there will be some. There should be some question where you have to use a standard strategy, and that kind of ties into all the forces and torque stuff. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, conserve the quantities. Uh, I hope uh, you remember what we are referring to. Whenever we say conserved quantities, there are only three quantities that we ever talked about that has possibly been conserved. The first we talked about is energy. Um, the second we talked about is momentum. And hopefully in the, you remember what the third one is. It's an angular momentum. I mean, angular momentum sometimes it sounds like momentum, but it's a distinct and different. You can have context where momentum is conserved, but angular momentum isn't. You can have angular momentum conserved, but momentum isn't. So, um, so we are, um, I guess with the conserved quantities, it's harder for me to um, tell you exactly what I feel is important. I mean, the, the, just the approach, uh, the problem solving approach continues to be important. That is really the number one thing that we teach in this class. It, it, you know, having come to the end of the semester here, I hope you realize that we didn't teach you very many laws of physics. Um, you can, all the laws of physics that you learned, you can actually fit them on half of an index card. <laughs> so that's not what this class is about. What this class is about is mathematical problem solving in the physical science context. So um, the conserved quantities give you a really rich ground where you can demonstrate your problem solving approach. Um, and uh, there are places where you can uh, be creative. And I think uh, I was trying to do a little bit of that with the uh, exam three and maybe exam two. Uh, with the final exam, I have a, a greater latitude on uh, writing a more open-ended question where it's not necessarily that there's one fixed model way that you can do the question, which is kind of what the standard strategy is about, but where there are multiple different approaches and they all lead to similar answer. They are useful in their different ways. So, um, so conserved quantities give me a good platform on which to test for the problem solving approach. Um, and the other thing, once we are talking about conserved quantities, um, what I'm really interested in is how these quantities change. How, um, the, how the conserved quantities, I'll just say they, how they change. So, I mean, it's almost, uh, um, um, uh, ironic or kind of self-contradictory if you uh, don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's, you know, when we say energy is conserved, we mean um, the energy of the entire universe is conserved. But the, the quantity of energy can be moved from one object to another. So when we talk about how energy changes, we are looking at how does the energy of an object change. And we talked about how it, you have to have a work done. So um, with the momentum, it's how there has to be a net external impulse. With angular momentum, it's how external torque changes angular momentum. So that understanding of how the, um, the conserved quantities, I guess I should say how they change for an object. Um, when you look at the system as a whole, um, the, that total quantity won't change. That's the idea of um, energy conservation and other conservation laws, but 
uh, for a given object, they can change and how, what, through what mechanism do they change? So that's the conserved quantities. Um, yeah. The applications are where, um, I don't know if I can give you one single thing other than, you know, I'll be testing you on oscillations um, and waves. Um, those were the application chapters. Oh, uh, I, just so that I don't leave this uh, uh, portion of the exam review without mentioning it, all these things here, they can be tied using uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation. When you look at Newton's law of universal, uh, uh, Newton's universal gravitation, you will see that um, they can, um, I, so um, let's see. I can ask you a question involving any one of these using Newton's law of universal gravitation. There's uh, obviously forces involved and there's conserved quantities involved, energy and angular momentum especially. And I guess uh, tying that to applications is a little bit trickier. There are ways to tie it to oscillations, uh, but I tend to not want to ask that question because it involves the whole equation of motion. I, I think it's a little bit too esoteric for physics 4A. Um, and I can even go to kinematics. Now, if I want to do um, uh, uh, constant acceleration kinematics, then I have to give you that approximate form. But uh, so I just want to make sure that uh, because it doesn't appear um, in this list here that you are not um, uh, forgetting Newton's law of universal gravitation entirely. That uh, this uh, will, um, it's a still a significant substantial topic in physics 4A. Um, and so, yeah, so skip out on it entirely. But this is a challenge. Um, don't obsess over it either. Because in the context of physics 4A, it is really a single chapter uh, out of the whole book. And um, and, uh, you know, we are not interested in gravity for gravity's sake. We are, once again, involved mostly on uh, how you solve mathematical problems. So uh, with that, I think if I talk about uh, over this too much, then I will be repeating what I already said in the um, exam review video. So let me get into the, uh, the content, to, uh, tab table of contents in your textbook to kind of go through the list and um, make sure I didn't forget anything. Um, and uh, this is more of a really reminder for me because if I don't have table of contents in front of me, it's very easy for me to forget something that I should have forgotten. Um, so let's just go start from, so you have two units, units one and two. In this class, uh, semester long class, we'd cover both. Um, let me just go through chapter by chapter and just blur out whatever's in my head. So chapter one, units and measurement. Um, um, oh, you should uh, probably review dimensional analysis because it gives you a very useful way to check your uh, algebraic work. And also um, whenever, when it comes to like creative problem solving, dimensional analysis is one of the most useful tool to have in your toolbox. Um, you probably should look at uh, solving problems in physics. Now that you have a better perspective, it's worth re looking at it again. See how much of that you agree, disagree, whatever. <laughs> Sorry, I'm thinking back to um, think pair sure that we stopped doing midway through the semester. Um, yeah, so you should look at it. Now, one thing I will tell you is that I try to avoid uh, having unnecessary unit conversion in your exam. Uh, you've already seen that, like I don't give you any questions where you have to convert inches to centimeters or miles to kilometers. Um, usually if a question has a speed in units or miles per hour, it's a good chance that the units are going to cancel out. So, um, so yeah, uh, yeah, so that's chapter one. Uh, chapter two vectors, um, I guess, so, for this class, uh, maybe we should have uh, emphasized the dot product more, but um, 
I mean, you should know vectors, you should feel familiar enough with the trigonometry so that you are, um, so that you can take a component of a vector. But I think that's kind of where, what's most important for this class out of chapter four, uh, ch chapter two, that you are able to decompose uh, uh, vectors into components for continue the problem solving using those vectors. Um, yeah. So chapters three and four are kinematics. Um, so, you know, constant acceleration kinematics, make sure you know them. Uh, and as I was saying in chapter four, uh, we are, I am going to be, make sure that I attest you somewhere about projectile motion. So make sure you don't <laughs> skip out on that. Uniform circular motion is also a good kind of topic that can be combined with, um, with a standard strategy. And I'll kind of have to take a look at um, what, what I can put on the test. I won't make any guarantees involving uniform circular motion, other than that you should know what centripetal acceleration is. So let me actually write that down. You should be familiar enough with the centripetal acceleration. Um, the formula for centripetal acceleration, which will tie into centripetal force. Um, so yeah, okay, so that's for kinematics, uh, chapters uh, three and four. And I already talked a little bit extensively about chapters five and six uh, that you will most likely be asked a question where you have to use standard strategy. And you might want to review uh, common forces so that you feel familiar enough with um, properties of common forces. It, um, let me try to point out, oh wait, um, yeah, I'll get to that. So in common forces, you know, there's uh, something about normal force. Now there are some common mistakes that people make, like thinking that normal force is always equal to weight. Um, um, like th that this is always true, uh, which um, I mean, uh, <laughs> Sorry, uh, this is something I'm unhappy with the textbook about that they wrote down this formula and numbered it because then this is what I'm afraid that people are going to do. That as you are trying to review, you are going to look at key equations and you are going to have this formula written in your formula card, n equals mg. And maybe if you are lucky, you will have this too, n equals mg cosine theta. And during the exam, you'll look at your formula card, you'll say n equals mg and n equals mg cosine theta. And um, either you will be confused, which I think is better, or you will think that normal force is always equal to mg. Uh, um, so the reason I'm saying all this out loud is so that you don't do that. Um, so that's uh, really one of the reasons I'm not giving this to you on a separate sheet. This, uh, these equations occur in the context of your textbook. So you really should look at the context in which those occurred. And this is the context where they were driving that expression for normal force. Um, and they say here that it can be less if object is on an incline. And it can also be even less if the, the surface is accelerating downward. And um, so, do, so now that you hopefully have better perspective, uh, read it through this chapter carefully because they do tell you correct information uh, about normal force. They give you this uh, district description of the support force or the normal force and that the normal forces were um, basically the, the, uh, the, this object is no longer digging into the surface. So, um, so, so that's the one key defining feature of the normal force, which determines whatever value it's gonna take. So um, to, to you know, review the, what you know about common forces so that you don't make common mistakes. Uh, normal force and tension are really the forces that um, it's easy to think the first time you see it that you understood it and you know to a great extent you do but um, kind of the the expertise and experience you develop it's uh, represented in how well you can deal with the corner cases the exceptions one the places where I have tweaked to your question in ever so slight way that if you don't know it, understand it thoroughly that you will get it wrong. You will make the common mistakes. 
I, I tr by the way, I try not to be tricky. I, my target uh, score for the exam is around 60 to 70 percent. That's my target score. So um, if I feel that as I'm writing the question, I feel that uh, more than half the class is going to miss it, I try to limit those questions. So, so, so that you are not, you know, freaking out. Um, but, you know, this is part of developing your um, developing your competency in uh, physics problem solving that you are able to pay attention to those details. Uh, friction will get to that in the next chapter and the spring force uh, make sure that it's a hook's lot force that it's a variable force and all that stuff. Um, Friction force uh, occurs in the next chapter here, and I would recommend that you review friction force as well to make sure that you uh, completely understand the properties of friction force. So when it comes to friction force, the kinetic friction is easy. Uh, there's a formula given for kinetic friction. There you go. You find the normal force, then you can find the magnitude of friction force that way. Um, this is a great number the equation because that's what you should be using. Um, where a lot of people need um, more care uh, taken in is understanding the static friction. And actually, now that we have done rigid body rotation, the correct understanding of static friction becomes even more important. It's that despite this expression being here, that um, there is no one single formula that tells you what the magnitude of friction force. This only tells you the condition. This only tells you how large friction force, static friction force can be. This uh, plot here kind of represents that. In the what they call static region, the, um, the y-axis is the static friction force. It varies. There's not a single formula that tells you the static friction force. The only, um, the set, constant you have here, and it, here it's uh, um, dependent on this uh, very specific setup that they're looking at, is that the static friction force is equal to the applied force. It's so that here in the static region, the object will remain static, it won't accelerate. Um, and once you get into kinetic region, then it becomes uh, much simpler to describe because it's a constant value. Um, so yeah, make sure you understand those uh, properties of friction. Um, you, the, this table, you don't really have to know. I mean, you should have some sense of when you have um, something that has kind of large friction, shoes on wood, rubber on wood. And when you have small friction, uh, uh, is there a Teflon? Uh, yeah, Teflon is still. So, um, but exact values, whenever you need the actual friction coefficient, I'll be giving them to you so you don't need the table. Um, yeah, so that's uh, chapter six, I think. Um, yeah, and the standard strategy, it's, um, I mean, you can review section 6.1, but it really, uh, I, if anything, I would review exam questions, portable TA questions, and homework questions, um, because it's uh, kind of going through this detailed problem solving that um, uh, you really need to just practice. Okay, um, so uh, the, uh, chapter seven through nine covers covers conserved quantities, um, energy, um, conservation of energy, and uh, the linear momentum. I guess uh, it might be worth uh, reviewing collisions. So without guaranteeing if I'll give you collision questions or not, mainly because I don't know if I will. Um, it's a context in which you can test your understanding of conservation of energy and momentum fairly well. It's uh, um, the platform where both of these concepts are in play and you, it's worth um, kind of looking at it. So yeah, I would uh, look at the collisions um, that's probably worth looking at. Um, and uh, we have rigid body motion, um, which kind of um, is in this presentation, I want to kind of embed that with you know, forces and torques and under conserved quantities. So whenever you're dealing with a fixed axis rotation, then now that's where you introduce torque, where you introduce moment of in or rotational inertia. Um, and you kind of redo what we had done before in this context, the Newton's second law for rotation. Um, so in the past semesters, uh, before fall 2017, I used to use this context as kind of a way to test all the mechanics. Uh, I don't do that anymore. That's why I'm doing cumulative final exam. But 
cumulative final exam is a great place where I can use some of this material um, in a way that I wasn't, I'm not const as constrained I, as I was in exam two. Um, so, um, so rotation, um, angular momentum. Uh, I guess that review video on angular momentum is probably enough. Um, yeah, static equilibrium that all gets covered here. And finally, um, yeah, so you have a chapter on gravitation. And I would just say, uh, read this particular chapter in detail and you will know everything that you need to know. Things like um, satellite orbits. This is a context where you apply the, that mathematical problem solving technique. Um, Kepler's laws will connect you a little bit into angular momentum conservation. So. Uh, yeah, with the gravitation, I would just say read it through the examples here, and if you feel comfortable with that, then great. Um, I, I guess, um, well, yeah, let me talk about this when I get to the examples of past exam. Um, so, oh, fluid mechanics, I completely forgot about it. Uh, <laughs> I put this on exam three. Um, I will probably ask you at least one or two fluid mechanics questions on the multiple choice so that I can say I tested you on it, so that I can say that your final exam is cumulative, but I think that's where it's gonna stay. I'm not gonna recover fluid mechanics so that we can say that we covered it. Um, just so, and, and so you remember, I think basically what, it, what we require is through section 14.4. Uh, uh, I will explicitly, this is a promise, I will not ask you Bernoulli's equation questions. So I, I did a lecture on it. You have video my, of my lecture, watch it. Uh, you see me play with the simulation, try that yourself if you want. But uh, there will be no, no, no question on your final exam that requires application of Bernoulli's uh, principle to answer that question. So um, yeah, so we, we cover fluid mechanics uh, because we don't cover it in 4B or 4C and we have to cover it somewhere. Okay, so that's a unit one, uh, mechanics. It, um, well, it covers mechanics. <laughs> and uh, what's in unit two is what I'm calling applications here. It covers oscillations and waves. And so, so you just did this for exam three, so maybe you don't need to, but for some of you, maybe uh, exam three came too early and you weren't prepared for exam three then because you have a good chance of seeing these materials again, now is a good time to review it or possibly see it for the first time. And one encouragement I want to give to you again, in addition to having done it in the final exam review video, is to say um, there's a lot of mileage you can get in these chapters in particular. That's not necessarily true in the other chapters. Is um, from just the pure memorization kind of just looking at these expressions and knowing what those mean, um, knowing this formula. And um, so, so yeah, I mean, this is kind of long list of formulas. And if you're just, uh, I guess, have those lists without any other explanation, then again, they may not be as useful. But, um, but you know, for example, this is the mathematical representation of an oscillatory motion. There isn't really a lot of stuff going back to kinematics or forces and torques you have to understand to put this to use right away. You know, when you have this formula, you want to find the velocity, you take the derivative of it, then you're done. Um, so, so yeah, there's a lot get, that you can get by in the oscillations and waves with a kind of uh, newly memorized material. So. Um, you know, that's the way a lot of people approach science before physics, because with the biology and chemistry, frankly, a lot of what you had to do was memorizing facts. I mean, maybe in chemistry, you do a little more math, but um, you, don't, you, don't, you don't often have to solve for a system of equations in chemistry, I think. I don't know, I never took college chemistry. But, um, so, so um, I also never took college biology. <laughs> so, um, what I can tell you is that uh, there is a lot of mileage you can gain uh, from just uh, memorizing these uh, factoids, trivia, 
Now, um, if that's where you stay, then once again, you will be limiting yourself. Um, you will, in fact, see anchor paper for exam three that I kind of uh, started out with these formulas to construct my um, my uh, uh, three out of five answers. So, you know, don't limit yourself there. Look back at the context. Know when this formula applies, when it doesn't. But um, um, there, there is a lot of mileage you can gain from just uh, reviewing, um, reviewing facts that are in these applications chapter. So I would uh, encourage you to take a look at it. Don't, uh, you know, let that go to waste.